good, good afternoon, everyone. I want to uh, welcome you to the provost uh, conversations. And uh, I'm Brian Payne, vice provost. And uh, 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 obviously, it's not the vice provost conversations, but the provost conversations. And uh, uh, Chandra wasn't able to, to be here today. But uh, I was fortunate. Uh, I feel so fortunate to be able to be here and hear the conversation. And uh, if, if you pay attention to uh, what these are called, uh, uh, that you see an S at the end where it says conversations and provost conversations and uh, it's uh, very fitting because this year the theme within that is that we have many conversations within each conversation that's set aside and uh, what, what has been done by CLT and uh, working very well is uh, we're hearing from departments about uh, what they're doing in their, their particular department. We started with uh, psychology and uh, they, they talked about uh, their initiatives, and uh, then we heard from uh, history, and uh, now that's history. <laughs> I, I try. I try. And uh, today we're very fortunate to hear uh, what's going on in, in physics, and uh, we're, we're going to hear from uh, first, uh, I don't know if you picked about the order, but uh, Mark Havey is uh, going to talk about uh, uh, how to engage uh, uh, upper level students in, in physics and uh, and then uh, we'll hear from Charles Hyde uh, talking about upside down pedagogy and uh, I just gave an upside down lecture but I don't think it was intentional so we're looking forward to hear about uh, some uh, of both in, in, <laughs> intentional upside down pedagogy and uh, uh, both Mark and Charles are uh, university professors and eminent scholars uh, definitely uh, uh, s signature faculty, uh, not just in <coughs> physics, but at the university as well. And then we will hear from uh, fr from uh, J Justin Mason, who is uh, the uh, director of the planetarium. And um, Justin's also very important to our university. He just won the Hayes Award for the uh, classified staff member of the year. And uh, what he's going to talk about is how to take uh, these com complex science concepts and communicate them both to pre-college students and to uh, the community at large. And he's going to focus particularly on astronomy so that uh, we'll know that uh, we shouldn't ask him what it means to be a Pisces because that's not the complicated <laughs> stuff he's talking about. <laughs> he's talking about stuff that's much more important. So uh, when they're done, uh, because this is a conversation, we hope you will share your questions, thoughts, and feedback, and your own tips as well. And I will turn it over to our very valued panel at this point. Thank you, Brian. Uh, my name is Mark Havey, and I'm going to be starting us off. Do I need to be close to this? It's pretty weird looking. It goes out of focus at about this distance for me. <laughs> so. Uh, so anyway, I'm Mark Avey from the Department of Physics, and I'm going to start the, the, the presentation uh, with a short overview about some of the things that are done in the physics department. And Charles is here checking on me to make sure that I do it right. Uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, and then after that, we're going to hit on a few major, major points. Uh, one uh, is uh, to discuss Brian. Uh, Justin's going to talk about the planetarium and also about a change in the way we do our undergraduate laboratories using uh, a small device called an Arduino. We call them Arduino labs. And then I'm going to spend some time talking about, uh, it's not exactly a flipped classroom model, but an upper level, a way of, a different way of teaching upper level technical courses, uh, not just physics courses, but all courses that are that are problem solving based, engineering courses, mathematics courses, things like this. And uh, we have some limited experience with that, but I'll show you, uh, we'll share with you what experience we do have, and then maybe we can move forward from that. Okay, so uh, Department of Physics, this is where we're from. Uh, there are four sort of major themes within the department. Uh, not all of these I'm going to talk about. Uh, we're going to focus some on outreach through the planetarium and some on innovation. Uh, which is the buzzword for trying new things. And uh, this is a picture, I think, from Charles's lab. It's a very nice picture. Okay, so in the Department of Physics, uh, we have a lot of uh, sort of talking points. 
Uh, and one of them is that we pay close attention to physics education research. We don't have a substantial amount of, of uh, research in physics education in our department, but we follow closely the research done at a variety of other institutions around the country and frankly lift any ideas that we think are useful and implement them. And one of those things that we've implemented uh, is the scale-up model for teaching introductory physics. Uh, and I'll show you a picture of the room uh, a little bit later and maybe Charles will spend a few minutes talking about, uh, about what we do in the scale-up process. Uh, we started the Physics Learning Center, I think Charles and Gail Dodge started the Physics Learning Center in the department more than 15 years ago, so we've been on this track for a long time. Uh, we also train and employ undergraduate teaching fellows, so our upper level undergraduates get some experience with teaching, uh, and they also relate very well to our introductory physics students, and so that's a nice synergy, we think. Uh, our senior thesis is also fairly recent, a few years, uh, and a lot of, all of our students do a senior thesis and they get a hands-on capstone sort of project. Uh, many of those students do a one-year project, fall and spring of their senior year. Some even start in the second semester of their junior year. And a few even show up in the summertime and do some work. So it's pretty dynamic activity. Uh, overall, we provide authentic research opportunities for undergraduates on campus and also at JLab. Okay, so JLab is a very important part of the uh, activities that we do in the physics department <laughs> and undergraduate education is a part of that. And finally, a general statement, uh, we love to hear new ideas. We won't agree with you very often probably, uh, but, but we love to hear new ideas and to see if we can thrash out some things that might be useful for, for all of us. Okay, so this is just a little graphical thing. This is uh, let's see if I can see what we've got here. Okay, this is what the, this is what the scale up room looks like in a typical teaching environment. This is Des Cook. And you see we have a lot of circular tables with a lot of students interacting with each other. And uh, a good number of our undergraduate introductory physics courses are done in this kind of model. Uh, then we also have the learning center. This is a picture of the learning center. The learning center is in a corridor and my office is right on the other side of this wall. And so I thought originally that that was going to be trouble indeed because I wouldn't be able to escape from the continuous chatter that goes on. But we have pretty soundproof walls and it worked out fine. Uh, being in a corridor, you might say, oh, geez, in a corridor. But it ends up being fabulous because a lot of people just drop in and drop out for a few minutes. Faculty walking by spend some time helping out students if they're having trouble. So it really is a quite dynamic and interesting environment for learning. And then this is a picture of one of our, uh, of one of our undergraduate physics labs. Uh, this is probably not set up as an Arduino lab yet, but uh, Justin will have more to say about that. So uh, before moving on to like, the uh, upper level undergraduate courses, I uh, want to kind of talk a little bit about the um, introductory courses first. Uh, and so in the department, we have several introductory courses, uh, the, you know, uh, the two level, I guess two series, conceptual physics course, where there's not much math involved. There's an algebra course. Uh, set and then a calculus course set, uh, and so all these all, all these classes they have lab components where their students are in there weekly doing experiments, and so uh, one of the things we kind of started to do was look at well how do we do these experiments what are they doing how are they doing them and try to you know can we always make them better it's kind of the, the big question how can you further them make them better, and so one of the things we used to use uh, for a very long time uh, was a Pasco interface. So Pasco is a company they make. This kind of interface unit, it takes different types of sensors, photo gates, smart pulleys, motion sensors, and just kind of actually plugs it in, talks to our USB port to the computer, and then can graph a lot of data, uh, can fit lines of data, and kind of show the students what they're doing. And so that way they can take the sensors and really, really implement and see what's going on on a, on a computer monitor. Uh, we've been using these kind of sensors since like, mid to late 90s. Uh, this last set was bought in 2004. And so these are getting fairly old at this point. They're starting to break. Uh, so it's like, okay, well, do we want to replace them? Do we want to stay with Pasco? What else is available? Uh, just because, you know, if we need to replace them, we might as well do it soon. Uh, and so we got to a point where we started to kind of do a little bit of research into Pasco. What, what is it going to be to replace these? Uh, as we talked to Pasco, uh, we found out that we need new computers because the program that these use to talk to the computer uh, doesn't work on Windows XP, which is what we used to have. If we want Windows 7, we need an all-new computer that's powerful enough to run Windows 7. So we need all-new computers. So that gets expensive quick when you need 20 new computers. 
or more because we, we need backups. You need some for research and development off of the side. So you're looking over 20 computers. Uh, it gets expensive fast. Uh, and so then we started looking at the interface itself through Pasco. Uh, the new version is $899 a piece. And again, you need probably more than 20 because you have 18 in the labs, a few for backups in case one crashes and you need to do quick repairs, and then a few for R&D. So you're looking at spending 18, 19, 20 thousand dollars just on interface units alone. Uh, and so from there, uh, you also have to pay a site license. Uh, these interface units use a program called Data Studio for their data acquisition. And so Data Studio is $500. So you're also paying for a program. So I mean, you're talking you know, 20, 30 thousand dollars in computers, 20 thousand dollars in interface units, and another 500 dollars or so for the, the program. So it adds up quickly. I think we estimated about fifty-two, fifty-three thousand dollars for the entire project. And so we said, well, what other alternatives are there? And I can pass this one around if you want to see it or come up afterwards. Uh, we started looking into what's called an Arduino interface. Uh, and our Arduino is a small little microcomputer. Uh, it's really small if you want to come in and take a look at it and just if, you know, five to eight centimeters side to side. I mean, they're pretty small, and they're pretty powerful nowadays, and they're cheap we can put together this entire box for $42. And so instead of spending $900 per box, we can spend $42 we can build them ourselves. Uh, a couple of student workers and I, actually we kind of designed these to work with the Arduino sensors we currently have. You mean the Pasco sensors? Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, the Pasco sensors we currently have. So we're not, you know, we're only replacing the interface. Uh, we had to buy new computers anyway for Pasco or Arduino, so we kind of went that route no matter what. Uh, so you're, you're kind of spending an allotted amount for that anyway. But uh, these were actually kind of retrofitting. We designed it around what does, the, our, our, what does the Pasco use. And so when we put these together, they're fairly cheap. So you can, you know, if you want to sell these or not sell these, but like market them to high schools, they can put them together themselves or you can sell the plans for it, to tell them what you use to build it, and they can build it for fairly cheap. It's kind of one of the models we're looking at is can we branch this out as kind of a schematics to help other people with that. Uh, from there, we're also using LabVIEW to program all this. Uh, in LabVIEW, the university has a site license. So rather than spending $500 on Data Studio, which the university doesn't have, we're using what the university already has available to us and incorporating LabVIEW into that. So all the computers are using LabVIEW. It's something that we already have access to, so why not? Uh, and then the other really great part is the sensors for these, uh, they're really cheap too, not just the controller. But Pasco, if you're buying a motion sensor or a photo gate, you're looking at a minimum of $45 per sensor, up to $150, depending on what you want to buy. Uh, the new ones for this, you can buy off different websites. They range $5 to $25. So they're much cheaper if a student does drop it or break it, which happens quite often. Mm -hmm. um, then you can replace it for $5 or $25 or $15 or something like that, depending on what you want. And so we take these new sensors. We have a couple of 3D printers. We'll print housing and casings for them and then we'll actually incorporate them into the labs. Uh, we're also working with the engineering department. They have some of their uh, upper level senior classes uh, designing some of the cases for our sensors. And so we're kind of working with different departments to kind of actually upgrade the labs a little bit. Uh, I think next we're talking about outreach. I didn't know. Uh, you can. Okay. Yeah, so education extends outside the bounds of the university. Uh, and so we're involved in quite a few different uh, outreach programs, and, and by outreach I don't mean handing out brochures about why you want to, uh, how to enroll as a physics student at ODU, but I really mean talking about science. Um, so uh, Justin will talk about the planetarium a little later, but uh, we have a number of annual or semi-annual events, the Children's Festival downtown, uh, usually the first week of October, first Saturday of October, we've been there as, over 20 years every year, except for the two times it got rained out. Um, we just look through all of our dem demos, bring a whole bunch of demos that are, are hands-on. So uh, children, their parents come, and I always find I have to have like a hook. I have to have like a one-sentence introduction to get them to, to be involved. Like say, well, you wanna, you wanna see how we know what stars are made of. And then I show them an atomic vapor lamp and some diffraction glasses, and you can see the unique patterns that are different between helium and neon, for example. And what's always great is you show something to the kids, and the parents kind of step back and go, can you explain that to my kid? <laughs> Thinking like, oh, maybe they'll explain it to them, and then I'll understand it too. It's kind of fun watching the parents like, yeah. explain it to my five-year-old again, please. 
Well, and uh, another thing I like about it is that, uh, you know, I've used the same demonstrations in the Children's Festival, in the introductory classes, and in graduate electromagnetism class, because it's the same fundamental principles, and you can talk about the fundamental principles at any level of whoever the audience is, and, and in particular working with graduate students, they're also teaching, and they're also going to be teachers, so it's good for them to see... Uh, to, to be looking at it from that perspective as well as, as a learning tool for them. Um, so Jefferson Lab uh, right now is on a schedule of having an open house about once every other year. Uh, so there should be one coming up sometime uh, late next spring, I would think. Uh, and we've been out there every time uh, showing a little bit about our research, but again, mostly just talking about basic physics principles and to some extent how those principles relate to our research out there. Uh, REU, you may know, that's the NSF's program of research experience for undergraduates. We've had a joint program uh, with Jefferson Lab for a number of years now. Um, and so uh, maybe a dozen uh, undergraduate students from all over the country come each summer, spend about eight weeks here in a Jefferson Lab working on research projects with faculty and Jefferson Lab staff. I was recently at uh, American Physical Society meeting and they had a session with undergraduates and I had about 20 students come up and talk to me about Old Dominion University and at least two of them had already done the uh, research experience at ODU so they, they knew about us. Um, we have a long relationship with Ocean Lakes High School. We have summer internships for, for a couple of uh, 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 students, every uh, high school students every year. Uh, Professor Weinstein uh, has been very active in the uh, Tidewater Physics Olympics. Uh, it's pretty much an annual event. Um, and uh, Professor Havey created a bang up video on uh, uh, ex introducing students to uh, research. For a lot of years, and probably many of you in your classes have also done this, is you occasionally send the students up to the board to work some exercises or challenge them to try solving some problem new. And, I, and I've done this for many years too. Uh, but uh, a couple of years ago, my wife and I were watching some, uh, some educational show on TV and it was about a program called Math 360. Has anyone heard of that? Okay, so you've heard of it. Anyway, it's, it's a way of engaging students from inner city schools to really get involved in learning mathematics. And I thought that's really cool because it's a radically different way of doing, of, of teaching science and mathematics. And so I started thinking about it and my wife who's a professional teacher uh, threw in a lot of ideas and we discussed ways that this might be implemented and used in the upper level physics classes because there are serious problems as you all know who teach even upper level you expect the students to have a certain level of skill a certain level of dedication and they don't for a whole variety of reasons and so is there a way is there one way at least to maybe improve that situation a little bit and that's how uh, I came up with this idea of pushing forward with an, a new way of doing this called quantum 360 the 360 refers to 360 degrees which means that quantum mechanics, in this case, is being done all around the, all around the room. That's all it means. It's, okay, so this, this image uh, that you see is a typical quantum 360 class that I was teaching. You see the, this guy's leading the way. He's doing the teaching. It's obvious, he's doing the teaching. I'm not, I'm back here taking the picture. Uh, there are five groups of three each. There's a couple on the other side of the room. And so we've got 15 students working in groups of three and uh, they're solving problems that I've prepared for them based on a short lecture or other material we've covered in previous days. And so <clears throat> this is the dynamics of how this, how this actually works and I sit back here and take pictures or play games on my phone. <laughs> so that's, a, that's, right, that's great. Right? <laughs> okay, so let me just make a, a short comparison between uh, the traditional way of teaching uh, upper level science classes and what I do, okay, and what Charles has done also and I think some other people in the department have tried this. Uh, the first, the lecture format, uh, it's probably a bit hyperbolic here, but we can say transcription, not transcendence, certainly not transcendence, and some transcription. 
Okay. Uh, more importantly, though, is that when you teach a lecture class, you have limited assessment, uh, and it's digital assessment. It occurs in long, sometimes only once on an exam. If you only give one exam during the course, you only get one assessment. It's too late. You've already lost a lot of the class if you do an assessment on that kind of scale. And even if you do homework on a weekly scale, uh, that's better, but you can do better. You can make it even more uh, continuous. Okay, students, all of our technical students have problems solving problems. That's what we're trying to train them to do, and it's difficult. And Alex uh, Goodenough has done a lot of work on that and trying to understand those kinds of issues. And always, there are some students left behind. Okay, and it's true. You have a pace, you have to go through the class, you have to cover a certain amount of material, and so some students can't have difficulty keeping up with that. Okay, and that's a shame, especially if the now, maybe they shouldn't be physics majors, you might say that, and be cynical about that. But the reality is, is that they have some ability and they have a tremendous interest. And so is there a better way of addressing their needs and moving them forward? That's the idea. Okay, so the 360 format. My experience is that, broadly speaking, you get a deeper and quicker understanding of the material in this format, which I will explain in the next slide. Okay. One of the advantages is you get continuous and individualized assessment. Okay, that means in every class, the teacher is interacting with every student, asking them questions, getting feedback, watching them work on the board, seeing what they're doing, where they start to go right, where they start to go wrong, and can intercede at that particular point or let them struggle for a while. Okay, in addition, there's peer feedback and cooperative learning. That is, the students work in little teams, these little teams. And I learned the second time that I taught this format that those teams are actually competing with each other. They're like looking over their shoulder at the other, other teams and see if they can get a solution before the other ones. I didn't anticipate, I probably should have anticipated, but I didn't anticipate that was going to happen. But it's actually not a bad thing. It's a healthy kind of competition with the students. Okay, and so, Thanks for the hyphen. Dynamical problem solving skill development. That's like thimble, shoals, channel, tunnel, right? <laughs> Consonant diphthongs all strung together. So dynamical problem solving skill development, okay? That means they're learning how to solve problems dynamically from each other and from the professor, okay? So it's not just how to solve a particular problem, but solving problems, science problems. Okay, and also along the way, as I alluded to a minute ago, we have team and leadership building. Okay, so some students rise to the top and they're leaders. You know, they are natural leaders and that's fine, but every student has to learn. And so in the dynamics of doing this, when the students have a solution to a problem, I'll go up and ask them to explain it to me. But I get to choose which one of the three students explains the solution to me. Okay, so that way the big cheese student, the one that knows everything and always has the answer, has to learn how to control their tongue and let someone else speak. And the person who is speaking needs to learn how to express themselves clearly and to understand the solution. Okay, so this works very, very effectively. Okay, so how is this, how is a course like this put together then? Okay. So before I go through this, I'd like to say that uh, this is very much a work in progress. I've taught two classes like this. Charles has taught one or two classes two. like this. And there may be someone else in the department that have tried it. Uh, and a person from Miami University, a uh, professor there, a guy that I know, uh, also asked me about this when I was visiting there. So the, there's very limited information. So any ideas you have, any experience you have, would be very useful. Okay, so what's the structure? First of all, you give away your lecture notes. Make a, make, a, make a giant, humongous PDF of the first five weeks of the semester or something like that and just give it to the students. And say, it's your responsibility to read this with all your notes, with all the crossing out, with all the stuff and mess that you had in your real lecture notes. Let them have them. Let them work their way through it. Every class, or nearly every class, has a mini lecture for foundational ideas and subtle points. By a mini lecture, I mean maybe 15 minutes out of a 75 minute class, maybe 20 at most. That's it. That's it. The rest of the time has to be, you might say, oh my God, there's no way I can finish what I have to do in a semester this way. But you can. I've done it. I know you can do it. Okay? So 
In general, there are also in-class team-based problem solving on the whiteboards with team solutions and team grading. Okay, so there are teams of three. They work the solutions. If they don't finish in a given class period, they have to get together between the two class periods, work out the solutions, and pass them in, and they grade it as a group. Okay, so they get a group grade for their group work. In addition, there are individualized, uh, traditional, it says daily, but really class daily, individual grading. Okay, so I give them the traditional homework assignment on Tuesday, they have to give me it on, back on Thursday, or then the following Tuesday. So it really compresses. So you can't give 10 problems for two days. You know? So you give a smaller number of problems, but you give them more frequently. And you get them right back to the students to the greatest issues. That's essential. Okay, so what's a no surprise exam? I learned about no surprise exams from Bob Fradkin. Anyone know Bob Fradkin? No, you know Bob Fradkin, as I mentioned. Bob Fradkin was uh, in the languages, foreign language department. He taught Russian and he taught uh, biblical Hebrew, something. No. The lecture notes. Oh, there is a text. Oh, oh, textbook. textbook. Oh, okay. Yes, that's All right. Question. No, I thought you meant if I read the book on this. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, um, do, you, do, you, do you use a, a textbook? Yes, yes we So do. that your exam will be based on book and then your lecture notes and et cetera? Yes. Okay. It will be based mainly on the work that they're doing in class. That's what I mean by a no surprise exam. And so when I was taking Russian classes, the professor said, we've got an exam coming next week. And here's what it's going to be like. You're going to have to walk into a barber shop and ask a hairdresser to cut your hair and tell them how much how to cut your hair. They're going to ask you how much. They're going to tell you how much it costs and all this kind of stuff. So you know the subject. You know that. But it still doesn't change. It's a real exam. You have to really know a lot. And so that's what I mean by a no surprise exam. They know what's coming. I can give them the most detailed list that you could imagine. You think it would make the exam easy? It doesn't. It doesn't. You could even give them the problem. <laughs> and it would make the exam. Okay, so one of the, uh, so it says also student participation is excellent and feedback is excellent. Okay, so this is feedback I've gotten from students who've, used, who've taken the class in this format. Some of them are in graduate school now, and two of them wrote me from, from, from two different schools and said the only class that I really can do well in graduate school is quantum mechanics, and it's because of quantum 360. So that was very affirming for me. It made me feel really happy about taking this approach. But again, it's just subjective. It's not objective. And one of the problems that I don't know how to address is how to assess effectiveness of this compared to a standard lecture course. I know student contentment is high, that I know for sure. Okay, and I know that some of the students who are struggling have come up to me afterwards and said, okay, this was a lot better. I learned a lot more than I've learned in any other class because you helped me. Okay, so those are the good things. But how we quantify it, like with pre-test, post-test, doesn't really work in this level of teaching. So I don't know how to do that. And finally, I've taught Quantum 360 and Thermo 360. And Charles has taught Quantum 360 a couple of times. Yeah, couple I'm on my second. Tour. <laughs> tour of duty. So. Uh, what does that mean? Quantum mechanics 360. Um, Thermodynamics 360. Is Thermodynamics that what it is? 360. Oh, yes, that's yeah. what it is. Okay. Okay, so I'm almost done with my part, and then Charles has a few things to say here. Uh, this is my, okay, you ready? This is my lesson plan. Okay, you might think uh, lesson plans are for elementary school. Okay, but look, look, this is a very tightly choreographed. Thing. It's really not so easy to do, and so you really have to plan out how you're going to use your time and what you're going to do in that time. Okay, so this is a typical plan from April Fool's Day. <laughs> it's just an accident. Okay, this is April Fool's Day plan. Okay, outline five minutes, return the exam, and discuss it briefly. Okay, this discussion could be longer if all the students flubbed up on one particular problem. I might steal 10 or 15 minutes from the mini lecture and talk about the subtle points of a problem. If there was a group issue, for instance. And then there's a mini lecture, the subject doesn't matter. 
15 minutes, uh, usually 15 to 20 minutes is the max I give for this. Uh, board work in groups of three. You might say, why groups of three? Uh, and it's because it's a prime number. <laughs> <laughs> well, one is too few. It doesn't one, work. One is not a prime number. One, yeah, one is not a prime number. Two. One is not a prime Two, and two is not really, it does, there's not enough rub of the green. If you play golf, you know what rub of the green is. There's not enough rub of the green with two people. And five is too many. If you get five, you get nuclear fission. Okay, the five, the five break into two groups. Okay, so three is, is really ends up being optimum for this particular kind of arrangement. Uh, and there's enough to fight, but not enough to go after each other with weapons. Okay, and so, then the board working groups of three, then their exercises. These are just examples of the exercises that I've given the students, okay? And so you need to prepare an exam in advance what exercises you're gonna to give to the students and work the solutions yourself to make sure that they're board doable in the time period that they have, okay? And then if students finish the above exercises, they return to the tables and we start on another mini lecture. So if they use up your stuff, you've got to have options, backup options. Okay, so so Charles is going to take over now and tell us something about what we, uh, what other things we're doing in this format. Anyone? This? Um, uh, okay, yeah. So uh, just a few comments about my experience in picking up on this uh, style from uh, Mark. Uh, so I came into uh, teaching quantum mechanics last year after most of the last previous decade teaching introductory courses and in that time we adopted this what goes by many names we've referred to scale up uh, Charles Sukana gave a presentation a, a year ago or so on, on this uh, so sometimes it goes by the name of upside down uh, pedagogy and so that basically is referring to this idea of breaking up the lecture into very short segments and then giving the students problems to work and so an emphasis on the peer uh, instruction so we have those round tables and then that students can naturally break up into a group of three and so what we do in the large classes where we have like 60 students is uh, so the students are sitting around those tables and then uh, every group of three students has a little whiteboard and they work on their problem and uh, the instructor and one or two graduate assistants and sometimes an undergraduate advanced undergraduate assistant will walk around and kind of look over their shoulder and see if they're making good progress, ask questions to, if, to, that, to try to point them in the right direction if they're having trouble, maybe ask questions to try to get them to think about the problem more deeply if they've already finished it. So that was my experience then coming in and I felt that was worked very well. Uh, so when I started to teach the quantum course and uh, Mark said he'd been doing this, for a couple of years, I thought this seemed really great. Um, so again, the, the ideal thing is every break up the lecture, so every concept is a brief lecture, and then there's an example that uses that concept. I'm maybe still struggling to keep my lectures down to only one concept at a time, but I really do appreciate the feedback. I find out what the students are doing. The students get a better understanding of what they're supposed to learn because they, or what they have and have not learned. Um, I do want to say a, a word about the use of the whiteboards and the fact you, you may have figured out that we're teaching a class of 15 students in a room that usually is used for 60 or 70 students, so it may seem like there's a lot of empty space, but it does work out very well to have all those boards on the walls and the students are working on the board. If they're working on a paper or on the little whiteboard on the table, it's very hard for me to see what's going on. with those. You'll, look at those pictures, I can look across the classroom and I can tell whether the group over there knows what they're doing or they're completely lost. And so I can you know, glance around the room and I know, you know who I need to go talk to um, to move things ahead, along. Um, and so sometimes the students say, well, you know, I want to write it on my, you know, my notebook so I have notes, but I can usually persuade the students that you know, they all have cell phones so they'll write it on the board together and then they'll take a picture with their cell phone, so those are their notes. Uh, so it can be kind of adaptive. Um, so a couple things uh, on this slide. I've, so this year I'm experimenting with the course capture. Uh, and I, I've 
done it with trying to capture what I write on the board, but there's a lighting problem and the, the colors aren't right. So uh, I've been doing it uh, so in two styles. Uh, on the left there, uh, you see just writing on pencil and paper with a camera that's in the ceiling. Um, and I can zoom in and so I can try to make uh, one. Basically, I just barely fit two pieces of paper on the screen, so it's blown up pretty big. And I try to train myself to write a little bigger than I normally would so that it's, it's visible everywhere. And then the other is a, uh, a touch screen uh, with a particular program. And so I'm just drawing with a stylus on the screen. I can stand up and look at the class as I, as I write. Um, and uh, as far as course capture, of course, that is independent of the technology. It's just capturing whatever is being broadcast on the, whatever being projected on the overhead projectors and whatever audio is there. Um, and uh, so I know that some of the students are looking at those lectures afterwards. So uh, that, that's working well. I'll see you know, more if I get more feedback about that. Uh, um, the, the computer, I, I do kind of like writing on the computer screen, but it, I also like the handwriting part because then after class I can, I can scan it and then immediately post it, whereas the computer thing, I have to go back into the class afterwards and transcribe it. I mean, it captures audio automatically. I mean, it captures the video, but it doesn't capture the slides as a slideshow at the end. So it's an hour-long lecture rather than 20 slides. But maybe that's a technology issue to be worked out in the future. Uh, so uh, last thing we want to kind of talk about is a little bit uh, is kind of going how using the planetarium as uh, a main source for the department. And so uh, one of the things that really comes up with the planetarium is it's a unique setting. You know, how do you use something as unique as the planetarium? Uh, you know, it's very diverse. There's different projectors. There's tables around the room. Uh, we have computers. You have kind of odd seating. You know, it's kind of classroom-esque where you have students in these round benches. Because, uh, I mean, it was designed in the 60s, and so it's designed as a planetarium, not as a classroom, but it's kind of classroom-esque where you can still be standing up there, kind of talking to the students, uh, and then you know, give them an introduction of what's going on. Um, or you know, the general public, they're kind of sitting here talking, you know, conversing with you as you're up in the front. So it's classroom-esque. Uh, a few things we have going on at the planetarium. Uh, we do have, maybe, oh, there's my unique and diverse setting. <laughs> I didn't look back to see to make sure it showed up. Um, and then the next thing, we, what we have going on in the planetarium, we have uh, formal teaching. Uh, what's going on is we had the physics 103 and 104 class. It's the introductory astronomy. Uh, this is a 400 person class that occurs over an MGB. Uh, they meet twice a week for lectures and then they have lab sections all throughout the week. I think there's 12 lab sections of like 33 students. So the students, every semester, we fill up this class because it's a general science requirement, not a requirement, but it meets your general science requirement. And so, I mean, you have every student, you know, all 400 of them coming through the planetarium every single week of the semester. Uh, so it gets used quite a bit. Uh, so there's lots of teaching going on in there. Uh, they do computer simulations. Uh, this, uh, this one is actually just kind of showing off uh, something really simple that they're doing, looking at the stars in the sky. As the sky rotates, what does it kind of look like, star trails and stuff like that. Uh, we use these computer simulations a lot because you can't say, oh, hey, go to Mars, take a sample of the atmosphere, come back and tell me what you found. You know, in astronomy, we're kind of limited to looking at different things. And so you know, you, we give them the basic concepts, we have them run through it with a simulation, and they come in really handy. We have 11 computers around the room. Students break up into groups of three, they kind of go do these simulations. Uh, we try to tie those together a lot with the hands-on experiments. Uh, the hands-on, they're doing things like uh, dropping two different mass objects to see that you know, acceleration and gravity is the same. They're kind of proving what Galileo did hundreds of years ago. Uh, they do different things where they test uh, carbon dioxide in an atmosphere. They take Alka-Seltzer uh, tablets, put them in a bottle with water, and then put a lamp on it and watch that if you have a bottle with no Alka-Seltzer carbon dioxide kind of building, it actually doesn't heat up as much. And so they're kind of proving atmospheric effects too. So we try to tie in some of these simulations with the hands-on by having them do one then the other uh, and just kind of do multiple different things throughout the lab. So they're not in there just doing one thing, computer simulations for two hours. They try to do some hands-on, do you know, something kind of simulation-like, and then actually kind of tie the two aspects together. Uh, and then we actually do use full dome movies. 
Uh, these movies are designed for the public. Uh, they are you know, they're immersive. If you've ever been to a planetarium show, it's the entire dome lit up with a movie. You know, we state-of-the-art sound system. So the students are watching a full dome movie that's uh, been created for the general public. And then we afterwards, after they're done with the movie, uh, we have questions, you know, like a little Q&A, try to get discuss discussions going with their lab instructor. So they kind of talk about the movie and the concepts too. So it's not just, you know, not using the dome itself, it's very immersive. So you get lots of diverse kind of things you can do in there. And then uh, where I have most of my experience actually is a lot of the informal teaching, uh, is doing the public outreach for the department. Um, and so what we, how we use the planetarium, you know, it's a major resource for outreach in the department. Uh, we try to use it as much as we can. Uh, and so we have local schools and summer camps coming in throughout the year. Uh, we have, I can't remember, usually a few dozen schools come in throughout the year. These can be anywhere from first graders to high school students coming in, uh, just from around the area, you know, in Hampton Roads. Uh, it can be 10, 15 students. I've dealt with 90 second graders before. So it gets, it gets kind of fun, it gets very dynamic in there. Um, and so, we also have these weekly public shows. We put on two shows a week. On Mondays, we do movies right now, so they're watching a full dome movie. And then on Thursdays, I'll give like a full 45 minutes to an hour of just what does the public want to see. You know, have them come in, and this is where a, a lot of the teaching really comes in. Is it's you know, um, what's the word I want to use? Um, there's a lot of showmanship to it. Uh, you have to be able to get their inner, you know entertain them, get their attention, keep the attention, and then how do you do this for the general public? Uh, that's, that's the hard part. Uh, because it's not like your students where they're, you know, they kind of have to come in, they're there because they want to get the grade, they want to pass the class, but how do you get someone to come in, watch an hour long show, and then decide to come back? Or how do they retain that info? Uh, you know, go back and tell their friends that they saw this. Now, how do you get that family with the two kids to come back to the planetarium multiple times to see different shows? Uh, so a lot of it's just, it's very informal and there's a lot of showmanship to it because you have lighting, you have projectors, you have movies, you have sound. Uh, but I'm sure it's a lot like a classroom where you, you know, you, there is a certain showmanship to it. You can't just stand up at the front and, you know, kind of do, you know, just kind of lecture and do almost nothing, I guess. But, you know, it's a slightly different kind of showmanship. You know, there's a different entertainment value. Uh, and so working with the public like that is actually kind of fun because uh, that very informal teaching and I don't, you, know, you can't really do what you want to do. Um, you, know, you can't just change everything because you have to kind of figure out, well, what are they learning? How, are, you know, how do you teach them? What do you teach them? What level do you teach them? And a lot of that I found is paying attention to the questions they ask. You know, are they asking questions? If I go over their heads, giving off spouting lots of numbers or concepts that maybe they're not familiar with, the general public, they kind of shut down and they don't ask questions. So you're just kind of sitting there talking to a room that doesn't respond. And so if you can pay attention to the questions that you're asking back, you know, do you get feedback on the spot? You know, you, you know, have kids that just love to shout out questions, and sometimes you get, you know, the adults will just start asking questions too because there's things they want to know. Everyone has kind of this common love for astronomy, so how do you get them entertained? How do you make them feel comfortable? How do you get those kind of ooh and ah moments while being able to teach them something? And a lot of that is really paying attention to how much interaction they give back. And so it's trying to give a public show uh, and teach something without going too far over their heads. So a lot of that really takes practice, uh, but it's kind of fun and just, you know, every show changes because your group coming in this week will be different from the group coming in next week. You can't teach, you know, um, if you have a bunch of kids at night, you can't teach the same things you would normally do if you have a bunch of uh, university or like college age students coming in. It's, it's very different. So it's actually kind of, it's a lot of fun. I love it. And then uh, one of the last things we do uh, we do have telescope observing sessions every so often. We try to do these uh, once a semester, maybe twice a semester, depends on the weather and how it's kind of cooperating. Uh, and these are kind of the same things as the public shows, is you have people, general public coming in, and people love telescopes. It's a big draw. And so how do you get them to look at something like Saturn and then teach them something about Saturn? And so uh, a lot of it is just, again, paying attention to the questions they're asking. Get them to ask those questions. Because, uh, I mean, if you get them to look at uh, Saturn through a telescope, if they've never seen it, they don't believe you that it's Saturn. I've seen people look at the front of a scope. They think we have some kind of like glow-in-the-dark sticker. Uh, I've seen people check. I mean, they, they don't think we're looking at Saturn. They don't trust us. Uh, but then how do you actually teach them something? And so it's kind of getting a conversation going. Uh, it's getting them to ask questions back and forth and then moving down a line if we have a line of people for the telescope, just kind of moving down and just kind of making yourself available to just answer one question after another. And they're not all going to be the same types of questions, but how do you just kind of move along? And a lot of that is just 
know, how, we, how do we use public outreach? And so it's, it's a very different style of teaching, uh, but it's another aspect of the department that we really have to make sure we pay attention to. Sad. I think we had one last slide. So I think we had a little comic to end on. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Is there a questions? And I think yes, we had questions. We had people, we had someone with a microphone walking around. So. Actually, just a, a question for you, Justin. Sure. Do you Do you use the um, the bad movie night to teach physics and biology? You know, talking about why the movie is bad, or not just because of the acting, perhaps, but because of certain principles that are totally violated. Oh, uh, so I guess you're bringing up the bad movie nights. Yes. Just for people that don't know what it is, uh, we watch terrible mm -hmm. 50s and 60s sci-fi movies once a month in the planetarium. Um, every, every once in a while, I try to talk about why they're bad movies. Uh, when we watched, um, oh. It was our, the very first one we did. I can't remember the name of it. Um, Voyage to the Prehistoric Planet. I think that's what the very first one was. They went to Venus. And so I talked about why that's a bad idea. You know, it's 900 <laughs> degrees. In, the entire surface over is hotter than a pizza oven in Venus. And so we tried to teach some of the science of it. I think someone got a rip in their suit. And they were like, oh, no, Venus poisoning. I don't, I, and so you talk about the atmosphere. It's 100 times thicker. You know, you can't breathe it, it's carbon dioxide. So yeah, we do try to give some of the science behind it. Uh, not every month, because it's kind of hard to give uh, some of the science behind a little bit of it whenever they, I think next month we're watching Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. It's, it's kind of hard to you know, give some of the science behind something like that. Um, but we, I do try to go through a little bit of like an introduction of like, okay, why is this bad? Not just acting and graphics and you know, made 50 years ago, but yeah, I do try to get a little bit of science involved there. Thank you. And f quickly for Mark, um, uh, the, the number of classrooms that have that kind of structure that you need with the boards all around must be quite limited. I mean, I teach many of my senior level classes, um, uh, but just in one room with 30 students, but just boards along one side. I imagine you can still adapt your 360 uh, to then an angle, say, of 100 degrees. Not very well. <laughs> right, not well, that's the well. problem. Really, it's a fair, you really want to have independent groups of three, and so it requires a special classroom in Thermo 360, we had to retrofit one of the university-mediated rooms by putting up whiteboards around the rest of the room, but it, they didn't, it was a big class and it didn't quite fit. Mm. And so getting in early and getting the right space for using this, if you want to try this, this method, uh, you should really jump in early. Well, how many classrooms like that are there? I don't know. Right. Maybe Charles knows. There's, there's one. It's called the scale-up yeah. room. Probably the scale-up room. Probably the scale-up room that physics has put together that can accommodate up to 90 students. And Beth, you might know also because you, you walk around. Probably the main um, room on, on campus that, that has that. With the, wi with the whiteboards. Um, but the university is looking at either retrofitting um, classrooms to go in that direction or as new classrooms are put up, for example, in the education building. I think there's still some opportunity for the new education building to put some of these classrooms up. So it's it's headed in that direction, but I think the the answer to your question is is very limited. You know, one or two probably. Yeah, and the classroom Mark mentioned about kind of retrofitting uh, for the Thermo 360, we put up uh, sticky whiteboards. Essentially, it was like a three by four, or four by four kind of sticky whiteboard, uh, and just kind of outline it. Uh, it's it's kind of like a roll-on kind of whiteboard for the wall. Uh, the problem is you get air bubbles or the, the rest of the classroom's not built for that, so there are just rows of desks. So the students are moving desks out of the way to get to the whiteboard. So it's, it wasn't a great solution, but it was, it was something. It was at least better than what we had initially. My question is very simple. I see that you uh, camera copied uh, your lecture. Do you need a software or something? Um, the capture process, I guess the university has some software, also the hardware that they're, that they're connected up to their central location so that the, the, the stream comes. The, uh, if you go back. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Gotta go back there. Oh. There you go. So, this is just a camera capturing what, what I'm writing on the left. Uh, on the right, uh, that is a software. That particular one is called iExplain. Um, and it has some nice features and some features that aren't what I would want if I were designing it. But, uh, and there are, there are a bunch of programs. And it, let's say I feel after about four or five 
trials or, or, or five or six trials with three or four failures, I feel now reasonably competent that I can go in and I know that the lecture, that it'll work and that I won't have massive interruptions in the middle and that it'll actually get captured. I mean, so like everything else, there's a, a little bit of a learning process, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and I don't know how much that costs. I mean, also it's a big screen that's touch screen, so you know, there's an investment there which I suppose the department paid, not the university? Yeah. That was ours, yeah. Um, I'm concerned about being able to cover all the material, and I think, Mark, you were talking, you, you assured us that it could be done, but I'm... It can be done because I did it, and the way, the way that it works is normally in upper-level lecture courses, uh, you do a lot of examples yourself, okay? I don't do any examples at all. The students do the examples. And they learn by struggling through the solutions to those examples. I can do an example in five minutes on the board, okay, I can, which means I can do a whole bunch of different examples. Or I can give those, those exercises to the students without solutions, and they can learn where those, why those examples are really valuable and from them. And so that's where you, it's a zero-sum game, the amount of time that you have. But that's where the time comes from. And because they have, and the second thing is because they have better understanding. Right. They can solve, once they get one problem, they can solve a whole class of problems much more effectively than they can if I just work an example, because they really get it. And so it does require uh, some real commitment to the process for the whole semester. I mean, it's, not, you, it's really hard to just experiment with it, so I just dove in and did it. That's the first thing. And the second thing that's important is that it really requires a higher level of teaching skill because at the same time that you're teaching, you've got to recognize the weaknesses, recognize the points, uh, do, a, do a dynamical assessment, and then address that assessment on the spot. So then, while they're doing the problems, you're walking around the room, seeing their problems, and say, what about this, what about that? Mm -hmm. And try to nothing. correct them, or at least lead them in the right direction. Yes, or just, yeah, just shepherd them in the right direction, yeah. if, if they're really going bad. One thing I found that was really fascinating was, that the difference between the best students in the class and the students that struggle in the class is that the students that are best in the class recognize very early that the path they're going down is not effective and they change. Whereas the students that struggle more, struggle more because they don't recognize that that's mm -hmm. the problem. So it's not, it's, it's intrinsically about their problem solving skills and recognizing where they are in it that's a crucial thing. And I never really appreciated that before doing this. So that relate to your the the slide you show you have an individual assessment. Yes. So is the, the, the can you provide some details? How do the students do the individual assessment? No, I do the individual assessment. Oh, you the, do. The yeah, I do the oh. assessment of the student. They do their own assessments, but I don't ask them what they think about other students. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't be doing that. So. Uh, First, I want to, uh, on behalf of uh, Chandra, thank you for saving uh, $18,000 with your interface. Uh, uh, yeah, I think we estimated 53000 oh, uh, initially, but with, we spent about thirty-two. I think. Okay, so I was yeah. in that range. Uh, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, what I'm wondering is, uh, did it, when you shift uh, to this sort of model, did it feel like at least initially you were giving up control of the classroom and then in the end did you actually have more control and then the second question is how might this apply to a lower level class the, the full-on model well i think the full-on model is being used in the introductory level classes in the scale-up model it's as near as you can do when you have 60 to 100 students in a classroom the dynamic has to be different you have to have more manpower more people power in the room because there's a lot more students to cover with up to 20 students, I've had, I had 20 students in Thermo 360, and that worked fine. I could easily handle 20 students. Uh, no one asked me about who forms the groups and group dynamics. You get 20 students, they're not all gonna like each other, <laughs> right? And so, uh, so every two weeks, we have the possibility of a change out of the groups. We make an announcement, does anyone want to change group? Just put up your hand, okay? No one does. Well, it's a little peer pressure, you know. You're in a group already, you're in a tribe, and you don't want to abandon the tribe. So uh, they also have an invitation to come see me privately 
and ask if they'd like to change. And then I mix up the groups myself a little bit. But generally, they've, they develop this group loyalty. It's really quite interesting effect that was totally unanticipated by me. Yeah, one thing I might add, the uh, studio class, so we started that in the introductory courses, and initially we had the labs fully integrated in there, which was a little bit of difficulty to do the labs in a room that wasn't set up for it, although I tried to make some sort of simplified labs that we could do. We've, we've gone back to pulling the lab out and having it in the standard lab room, but I think with the Arduino labs, we have something that's much more compact and there's greater potential for sort of integrating lab exercises into that studio format. And I think that's something we can explore in the future now that we yeah. have this uh, infrastructure. Our next plan is actually we can make this kind of standalone, so you don't even need a computer. So that way you can just kind of walk in, drop it off at a table, and they don't even need a computer anymore. Uh, so that's kind of the, the hope of the next plan. Some of these have, uh, some of the Arduinos that you buy for 20 bucks have, uh, not only they have USB, but they have uh, Wi-Fi. So in principle, the student brings their own computer and then this is just an interface that you've they've got a program and eventually hopefully the students will write the programs too but it's a standard language so it's straightforward I'd like to echo a couple of points on your 360 program I've been doing that actually for a couple of years myself with smaller upper level four classes um, I'm very jealous that you were able to do it in an hour and a half lecture because you get much further because right, you really can't do without the mini lecture, it seems. Yeah. Um, you made a comment about the competition, and I found that exists definitely within the groups and between the groups, and I find it, that it works very well to motivate students that would otherwise be completely unmotivated. So the competitive aspect there seems to work out really well for that. Um, you also uh, noted that you give daily homework or every class period. I, I've done that too, and it seems to really help force students to stay on, on, on track. Right? But it's a lot of work to grade all that homework all the time. Yeah, it's a lot of work. That's the downside, one of the downsides. So, yeah. Um, and uh, Charles, with your handwritten lecture notes, I used to have a laptop that had a convertible touch screen. And I used that for my lecture notes, and that worked out really well. Because then you can post them as PDFs. Yeah, I mean, I experimented with that a little bit. It was, I didn't have very good resolution, so this one has a much better resolution. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I've got to go teach this Quantum 360 in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> one last thing, uh, Mark, you're teaching 111 this semester too, right? Uh, do you see any way of adjusting this for this large non-major course with an incredibly packed syllabus? Maybe that question is best addressed to Charles about what's being done in the department okay. for 111, 112 in scale-up mode. It's under discussion right now. There's some concerns because it's a oh. um, I know you want to say. I'll just say it is being discussed. So 111, 112 refers to the algebra-based course. The scale-up course is being done in 231, 232, which is the calculus-based course. It's a slightly different clientele for the uh, algebra-based course. And so there are some concerns that have been raised and uh, fr from a teaching perspective. And so that, that is being addressed on the undergraduate committee right now. And we may go in that direction, but that decision hasn't been made. And then there's just a practical consideration also. We have many sections of those courses. And we have one scale-up classroom, which is pretty much used day and night. We have evening classes, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night. That room is used as well. So if we were to go in that direction, um, we would have to uh, build another scale-up classroom. Uh, that won't stop us. If we decide that that's the way to go uh, from a teaching standpoint, then we'll find a way to build another scale-up classroom. I mean, I, th I think we're out of time, but um, I just wanted to ask at the very beginning you said, um, and, and thank you so much, first of all, for sharing this, because um, I'm from Arts and Letters, and I was totally, I, I'm just coming here to really see if, like, um, you know, the, if, if we can really apply these across disciplines, all this stuff, and I'm totally inspired by this. Um, so, so coming from, you know, a totally different disciplinary background, I think this is fantastic, and it's really wonderful to see. Um, but you said at the beginning something kind of provocative, I thought, which was that you can't, how do you assess the effectiveness of this method? And you said you can't use pre-tests and post-tests. And I was just curious, like, what, what, why? Like, to me, I think, why not um, use, like, a pre-test and a post-test 
for, for this type of, you know, if, if we're, it's hard to assess anyway classes. I mean, I think that's a whole other issue in some ways, but I was just curious uh, more to the, to the rationale behind it. Like, I, I, I don't, I just don't see why not. Like, so I was just curious. I guess, I guess that the, uh, the technical level of the material changes so much from the start to the semester that it's not really about very much of a conceptual development. Like, there's a force, there's a force concept inventory that you can do for introductory physics classes. Uh, that works on that level because it, it, it tests there whether some of the traditional or standard misunderstandings of forces and stuff are replaced by a more accurate understanding, conceptual understanding in an introductory course. But in advanced courses, they start by having heard of some differential equation, maybe Schrodinger's equation, and by the end, supposedly, they've solved a lot of problems associated with that. So the development is less conceptual and more mathematical, technical. So I couldn't pretest them on that level. That I did give a pretest, post-test, mm -hmm. but it was the same test. I just gave them the test at the start of the semester based on a modern physics, uh, third semester physics bunch of questions, and at the end, and it was interesting. Some of the questions they got right at the start, they got wrong at the end, and the ones that they got wrong, <laughs> it, so it told, me, it told me absolutely nothing. It was fascinating, but I don't know what to make of it. So oh, I like that. Thank you very much for coming. We uh, encourage you to attend other Provost Conversations uh, given by the Center for Learning and Teaching. And thank you very much, Physics Department. Yay. Thank you. Thank you.